populace of the country the Christian believes. He dispatched a shipload of natives over the ocean to his homeland harbor that all might see what he had found here. Diego Pau and his crew grew more and more delighted with it. He They erected near Luanda the second of their forts. We all have our backs to the audience worshiping the bogey. And um, we could see out of this, and Ross Cash was down front singing, and we started hearing these voices coming from the stalls, as they call them, the balcony, and uh, saying, Yankees go home, and all kinds of things that we couldn't quite make out. There was a group of uh right-wing radicals in London who, upon hearing about this anti-colonial play, uh, decided to uh, organize a, a group of uh, protesters. And in the middle of one performance, um, they had people scattered throughout the theater. And they were all over the balcony. And they started throwing things down. Roz Cash was standing dead center if anybody had a gun, she would have been a perfect target. Dead center singing a protest song and what this was going on. And I was in the middle of a song and I stopped singing. And I heard, I think it was Esther Rose said, sing, damn it, sing. And we started picking up, sing, sing. And I was screaming off, sing, Roz, sing, sing. And everybody kind of like joined together in spirit. They just moved together in spirit. And the sparks that just came, I mean, really, you could almost see sparks coming from the actors out to the audience. And he took from the inhabitants their land. And he took from them all else belonging to them. And he stripped the villages of their occupants. So the villages turned to shambles, and the fields lay fallow. Each single year, he dragged off 10,000 captives, while those who came later shipped away millions. In this way, Diego Cao taught a people who had received him kindly to know a hatred that has ever since burned. I lost count of the um, ovations, but it was that was a performance to remember. It was it was simply simply a shock, but it was a it was an awakening too. And then after when we left the theater and went to the hotel, I don't know exactly when it happened, and someone had scrawled "Niggers go home" on the wall. Then it was uh, it was quite real, quite real. On April 4th, 1968, four months after the premiere of Song of the Lusitanian Bogey, Martin Luther King, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, was assassinated. His murder touched off riots, looting, and waves of disorder in more than 120 cities in the United States. The era of nonviolent protest and race relations had ended. In the midst of this near revolution, the Negro Ensemble Company returned from its tour of Europe to confront a chorus of criticism concerning its purpose, its function, and even its name. It was accused of not being a true black company because it was financed by the White Ford Foundation because it was located in a multiracial neighborhood instead of Harlem or Bedford-Stuyvesant, and because it had produced the work of white playwrights. It was suspect for its continued association with its white administrator, Gerald Crone, and it was labeled Uncle Tom for retaining the word Negro in its title rather than the now preferred black. The Negro Ensemble was rather more conventional, not in a negative sense, but doing 
plays that were they, were, they were trying to, I think, attract both a black and white audience, not just a black audience. That's my surmisal. Uh, first of all, because of their location, and uh, secondly, because of the kind of plays they were doing. We didn't spend a lot of time uh, telling white people how wrong they were. I think a lot of them already knew that in the 60s. That was being done by a lot of other people. We didn't, we didn't feel that that was necessary. Uh, what we wanted to do was to show what we were about. We wanted to share some images that were not being shown anyplace else. We wanted to show conflicts that had nothing to do with racial conflicts. We felt very, very strongly that the way to do it was the way we were doing it. There were other theater companies started by and administrated by, administered by, by, by just people just as talented and just as dedicated as we were, but with different philosophies as to how to go about building and sustaining a black cultural institution in these times. The play that highlighted the NEC's second season spoke to the vision which had always animated the company. It was by a contemporary black American. Its subject was not middle class ambitions, but working class reality as experienced by millions of blacks living in the nation's ghettos. And it had been shunned by all the established theatrical producers until it found a home at the NEC. The author was Lonnie Elder. The play was Ceremonies and Dark Old Men. Everybody dies, Adele. This whole place was built for us to die in. But you, you bite, you scratch, you kick, you do anything to stay alive. Yes, you bite, you scratch, you kick, you steal. But still nothing changes. Just as I was doing, coming back here thinking that I could help Mama overcome the troubles in her life. Adele. I'm sick and tired of hearing about your sacrifices. You came back here because you had no place else to go either. You got scared too young, too soon. Mama was going to die anyway, and you knew it. Yes, I knew it. The very first day I came home from school, I took one look into her eyes. I knew it. And so I waited, thinking maybe I could get back to school, maybe find someone to love. Or maybe just float out into the world and let whatever was going to happen, happen. Oh, my God, she took so long to die. And when she finally did, I knew what it was that made her so inexhaustible. I got so close into what she was as a woman, I wanted to be like her. And so I found myself doing as she done taking care of three grown men, trying to shield them from the danger that waits for them beyond that door. But who the hell ever said every black woman had to be a damn savior? We were on tour with Ceremonies and Dark Old Men in California, and my father came to that performance, and he was overwhelmed, just overwhelmed. And uh, I saw it then, he became interested in theater, he became interested in what I was doing. Uh, he became interested in the NEC actors. And f really, for the first time, my stepfather, who was a janitor in Sacramento at that time, uh, saw some theater that had some meaning for him that was about something he knew about, people he knew about. And that's the way uh, NEC affected a lot of people, I'm sure. The play was praised by the critics and broadcast in prime time on ABC television. More significantly, it tapped deeply into the experience of its audience with compassion, with humor, and with the piercing ring of truth. I grew up in, in beauty parlors and barbershops, and so I had a special affection for Ceremonies and Dark Old Men because it takes place in a, in a barbershop setting. And I, and I said to myself when I saw it, here are some, this is like what my life was about, and it was the first one of the first opportunities where I really saw a part of my life reflected on screen and I felt as if I belonged. One of the things that was very, very exciting for me at NEC in the very beginning was the fact that part of the, the vision of NEC was to develop 
an audience that had never experienced theater before, particularly people who had um, never even been out of Harlem. I mean, they were going to the theater, so they took their lunch. <laughs> you know, sometimes in the very beginning, when NEC first started, they were passing lunch back and forth in the audience. And you go out on stage, and you, it was very difficult to perform because, I mean, the food was smelling great. You know? Practically every, every off-Broadway, white off-Broadway producer and Broadway producer at, at one time or other read ceremonies of dark old men, but none of them were ever interested in it. And if there hadn't been no Negro Ensemble Company, I doubt if ceremonies in dark old men would have ever been produced. There is um, a quotation from one of my favorite writer's plays, Maxim Gorky. He did a play called The Writer. I think that was the name of it. But then at the end of it, he said, I sing a song to the madness of daring. And you really had to be mad to dare to establish a black theater company amidst all the misperceptions and misconceptions about whether or not blacks will attend theater. 1971 was a good time for the madness of daring. Attendance was up to 95% of capacity. The training program boasted 125 students in all areas of professional theater, all free of charge. The Playwrights Workshop showcased 13 new plays that year, and tours were playing to enthusiastic audiences throughout the United States. But despite this heady success, the NEC found its financial structure crumbling. The cost of operations had sharply increased in the three years since its budget was planned, and the original Ford Foundation grant had come to an end. The NEC never had enough money to do all the things that it wanted to do. Uh, we were not just running a theater company. This was not a commercial enterprise. We, were, we had a 145-seat theater. When we sold out, we could only pay a very small part of our, bu of our budget. To maintain something year-round, is very costly, even as a small institution. You're paying overhead constantly. It isn't like the commercial theater where you, you go in and, uh, and if there's an audience, you continue. If they're not, you just get out. You can't get out. You have to stay in there, in, both in fat times and lean, and they're mostly lean. We were on tour with Ceremonies and Dark Old Man, and uh, one of the managers came backstage and said, uh, we're no longer going to have a a resident company and we will be jobbing in actors and we had, we we knew this was coming um, so um, we were let go as an ensemble and as a resident company staff also was cut back and salaries deferred the free training programs were canceled by the 1972-73 season even the number of new productions had to be severely curtailed because of the cutbacks, if I uh, remember rightly, we only did one play that year. We did several workshop readings of new plays, but only one on the main stage, and that was Joe Walker's The River Niger. The River Niger is the story of Johnny Williams, a Harlem house painter poet, who simultaneously must come to grips with the disappointments of his life and with the cries for black revolution exploding in the early 70s. The play portrayed the family as the deepest and most reliable source of strength and self-respect for the black community. You son of a bitch, why do you keep fucking with me? What do you want from me, you bastard? Johnny, don't talk like that. That's blasphemy. He keeps fucking with me, Maddie. When I was a kid, bigger kids used to always pick on me. I had to fight every day. They said, because I was a smart aleck. Is that why, you bastard? Because I'm a smart aleck. You can't talk to him like that, Johnny. He'll turn his back on you. You know what I'm going to do on Judgment Day? I'm going to grab that motherfucker by the throat and squeeze and squeeze until I get an answer. But he doesn't have to give you an answer. I thought you said, get me behind me. I thought you took care of Satan. I tried, Maddie. 
I tried. You don't know how fucking hard I tried. I know, baby. I see you every second. You should let me whip him out, man. You should let me whip out the bullshit. We weren't made that way, baby. You should let me whip out the money changes. You deserve so much more than this nothing. I wanted to do so much for you, Maddie. I've got you. I've got the kindest, sweetest man in the world. I've got the Rolls Royce, baby. I could have done it, Maddie. God knows I could have done it. I know, baby. I put it on you. I stopped you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me, sweet baby? Please forgive me. I was so selfish, Johnny. I was so goddamn happy. All I ever cared about was to see you walk, stumble, or stagger through that door. I only complained because I thought I should have said something. But I never meant it, Johnny. I never meant a word. You couldn't have given me nothing more. I just keeled over and died from too much happiness. Just keeled over and died. Capacity audiences overflowed the St. Mark's Playhouse. The play became the first NEC production to move to Broadway, where it ran for nine months, won the Tony Award for Best Play of the Year, and then embarked on an extensive national tour. The River Niger, it had a lot of full out of work. It didn't shock me, I'm not shockable. But this was an AME church, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Brooklyn. And this good old sister, may she live forever, she said, well, Mr. Leakes, I think we'll take the whole house. You can imagine all these lovely old ladies, black ladies, deaconess, um, those who sit in the amen corner and what have you, coming to hear and see the River Niger with all those full letter words. And perhaps the greatest flattery that could be paid to the NEC was this letter I received from this lady who organized it. She said, dear Mr. Leakes, thank, I remember it almost verbatim, thank you so much for inviting us to this marvelous play about us. She said, um, at first I was a little bit concerned about the language, but after a while, we forgot about it. Isn't that marvelous? The River Niger's success briefly eased the NEC's financial dilemma. Once again, the company could attend to its primary purpose, the imaginative examination of the black experience and all its moments, whether shameful or proud. Home by Sam Art Williams, for instance, is a fond, lyrical remembrance of life in the rural South. Could have picked a better day than Christmas Eve. Every Negro God may go south for Christmas. Why don't some of y'all buy a car? Or take the train or fly? I guess not. Greyhound Bus is a national Negro institution. Like a shoebox full of chicken grease box soaking through. Lady, stop that baby from crying. Folks want to sleep. Oh, oh, man, will you put your shoes back on? 